Hello and good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, my name is James Pasco, uh, but please call me Jim. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about how to combine modern C++ and Lua, um, which, uh, if you've not done so before, is actually a really good thing to have in your sort of programmer's toolbox of um, tricks and, you know, ideas. Um, so a few things to point out. Uh, uh, this is my URL, so this is me, this is my email. Um, the slides are online, so if you want to go here, you can. Uh, a lot of the slides have links in them to relevant sources of information. Uh, and the GitHub for the example code that goes along with the presentation is here. Okay, so uh, let's move on. So, okay, we're going to start by talking about software flexibility and the motivation for this technique. So um, I think it's quite useful to sort of have some idea of why you might want to do this and in what circumstance is actually appropriate. So as part of that, we're going to look at a real-world example, and that's going to be about high-speed rail, um, where these ideas have been implemented and are being used very much in a sort of mission-critical um, environment. So, um, so they've been, you know, kind of validated in that sense of the word. And I think it helps to have some idea of why you want, want to deploy this technique uh, in mind as we progress through the presentation. So next, we're going to discuss all the juicy details of how to actually combine C++ and Lua. And this section is going to include lots of examples, um, including a C++ Lua starter project, uh, which I've written for, for the presentation, um, called Lua Chat. So as part of that, we're going to talk about concurrency and asynchrony, uh, two of my favorite topics. And then we're going to get down to sort of performance considerations and the conclusion. So the talk, we're going to start with sort of software philosophy. And then we're going to sort of deep dive through the layers and end up talking about I caches, D caches, and L2s. So flexibility. Um, question. What does it mean for software to be flexible? So if anybody's got any sort of immediate uh, ideas, then please pop them in the chat window. Um, uh, I know there's a delay, so I'm going to uh, sort of put a few words on the screen. Um, but if anybody sort of you know can think of anything, then please do um, pop it in the chat window. Um, so portability, okay, yes, I think we would all probably recognize portability as being a characteristic of flexible software. That seems fine. Um, evolves well over time, yes, absolutely. So software that's flexible does tend to evolve well over time. Uh, and this ties into this notion that, um, you know, you have sort of programming versus software engineering. So if you listen to uh, Titus Winters, he, he's talked about this quite recently, and he's sort of saying, well, Programming is about, you know, sort of filling in the hole at your feet or the pothole at your feet, whereas software engineering is about how does your software evolve over time? Are we still using this piece of code in five years? Um, does it still meet all of the requirements? Th those kind of considerations. Easy to change? Yes, I think we're all sort of probably would agree that uh, flexible software is easy to change. And linked to that is, you know, adaptable behaviors. So can we um, change the behavior of the code when we need to? But the, thing, the place that I'm really going with this is this, you know, so um, coping, it, you know, flexible software to me is about coping with future unknowns. So a lot of my personal experience in software is that, um, particularly in startup environments, is that we sort of do some upfront requirements analysis, and then the software team essentially have to either react or, you know, uh, end up um, sort of, you know, trying to integrate new requirements or changing requirements. Um, you know, under high pressure. So really what I'm trying to sort of say with this talk is how can we sort of embrace that a little bit and make our lives a bit easier in the future by building in a bit of flexibility from the outset? Okay, let's have an example. And by the way, um, uh, the first time I put this slide on the screen, uh, Phil said I should rename the talk to C++ and Lua on Rails um, because we're talking a lot about Rails. So I thought that was very good. Um, I think I might, might do a future talk with that. But uh, um, So this is a real-world example of how these techniques are being used. And uh, by the way, when we see a slide like this, um, you know, that'll be a good place to sort of pause for questions. So, um, okay. So Blue Wireless, okay. This is the company that I work for. Uh, originally, we were uh, an IP licensing company, but it's moved into a product company. Now what we do is IP networking over 5G millimeter wave links, and that's in the 60 gigahertz spectrum. Um, so what the company produced uh, is an 802.11 AD Mac and Phi, which the combination of which is called a Hydra. 
uh, and plus a large software stack that sits on top of that. So uh, five firmware, Mac firmware, a BH2, uh, a Linux driver, a uh, plus all of the user space components that go along with that. So the idea is to be able to provide high bandwidth, low latency, mobile internet. And what I mean by that is you can have up to three and a half gigabits per second wireless links of up to a range of a kilometer. So, um, and then the idea is to take that and to mount that technology onto trains so that as trains progress along a track, then uh, the commuters and the passengers inside can access high bandwidth, low latency internet, which is you know, very different from what we have now, which is typically cellular based. Um, and you, know, you might get 100 megabits or something if you're lucky. So one thing to point out is uh, whenever I talk about embedded devices, these are very high-end embedded uh, devices. So the quad-core ARM V8 network processors with lots of DDR and you know, things like iCaches, you know, big caches and cache coherent interconnects. They run desktop Linux, so you're, you can log into them, you can SSH into them, and it's like using a, a desktop machine. So, OK. Um, this is what the, the radios actually look like. So uh, you can see the unit on the left. So this device is a train top radio. And we would typically have two of these mounted on the roof of a train. That feeds into this in-train component. This is a network processor. Um, and uh, that connects to the train's onboard Ethernet, um, which then uh, connects into what we call a customer connection unit. And that's the device that you inter interact with. So when you board a train and you scan for Wi-Fi um, and you create accounts and things like that, that is a customer connection unit. So the customer connection unit talks to the in-train unit, which uh, has the radios mounted in the train top unit. Then along the track side, we've got these units. Um, so they are spaced at approximately a sort of a kilometer uh, apart from each other. And you can see these PTFE windows here um, these white windows, this is, these are actually where the radios are uh, mounted. So, um, so that's what they look like. Now, I've got a very short 40-second video clip here. Um, and the idea of this really is just to sort of give you an idea or an appreciation for the kind of environment that we have to sort of operate in. So obviously, you've got lots of things like reflective surfaces, tunnels, curves, a lot of geographic variation in the, in the environment, weather var variation. And um, what uh, the software team was tasked with, or my team, um, is to provide a piece of connection management software that's going to, in effect, uh, make all of the decisions about which radio to connect to and when as we proceed along the track. So you can see these sort of uh, rippling uh, radios. Uh, um, and basically, the connection management software on the train has to make a decision about when to hand over, when to connect to a radio, and also, uh, you know, when to monitor a link, and um, you know, how basically can we maximise bandwidth? You know, whilst obviously coping with all the geographic variations, the reflective services, and there are, you know, there are literally thousands of edge cases. So, connection management, so absolutely mission critical uh, piece of software. Um, without it, uh, the software obviously the technology wouldn't work. And as I said. Basically, what it's doing, the connection manager is deciding which radio to connect to on the track side and when. So there might be multiple radios in view at any one time, and the connection manager is making a decision about which one is going to give the best performance. So the first thing we implemented, so this you know ties into the sort of programming um, aspect, was very much a fixed behavior. What we were doing is just connecting to the strongest signal. Um, and that was really as a kind of placeholder to, um, you know, because we had, you know, obviously in a startup, when you have zero, then you need to get to something very quickly. So that was that was something. Um, but this was, you know, a, a, a piece of C++ 98. It's very monolithic, um, not written by me. Um, uh, uh, but it did its job. And by all measures, it was uh, well written and there were very few bugs in it. So what we saw with actually using this was that there are a lot of anomalies. And I've sort of indicated that because you can imagine there's a lot of edge cases and a lot of uh, circumstances where the radios are doing things that you would think were completely impossible. But actually, because of the RF environment, um, then you know, it's very plausible um, you know, to do that. Uh, so there's a lot of variation and a lot of uh, uh, issues you know, trying to actually get repeatable deterministic performance. 
software updates very costly. Um, because it was C++ 98 and it was monolithic, it meant that any time uh, a customer or an FAE or somebody who was out in the field wanted to make a change, then the software team had to do it. And this is a very key point because um, not only that, but when the software team were, were given the task of, say, implementing a, a small feature, then everything would take quite a long time. You had to do a sort of a design, you know, implementation, test, debug, um, and then a deployment cycle. And the, the fastest we could turn that round really was, you know, sort of about a week. So improvements could not be made fast enough, right? We could not sort of learn from the environment, and look at what we're doing, and, you know, we could not turn the handle fast enough. And this is absolutely crucial. And the other thing was is that, the, you know, the software team was just completely overwhelmed. So what do we do? Okay, right. So like all good software engineers, we do a complete redesign um, of the software. And this time what we did was we went for a decoupled architecture. So C++ 17 and Lua 535. And the split is, is sort of uh, in the middle. And basically there are two key abstractions um, that you have to understand. So actions are implemented in C++. And these are things like scan, connect, probe, GPS, influx database, SNMP, that kind of thing. They are designed to be capabilities that are modular and separate from the rest of the um, architecture. Then the actual behavior of the software, the thing that's doing all the decision making and trying to determine when to make connections and when not to make connections is implemented in Lua. And that is implementing this term beam choreography, um, which is a term that Blue Wireless has invented uh, and basically what it means is it's referring to the sort of the sequence of connections and disconnections you make as you proceed along the track. So now, suddenly, changes can be made in the field by the FAEs. Because they're changing Lua, not C++, it means you don't need a compilation environment in the field, right? What's more, because Lua is much simpler to read and uh, understand than C++, um, then people who are sort of, you know, not completely untechnical, but had some technical background, but not a C++ background, um, could suddenly make their own changes. So they could answer their own questions, they could um, deal with customer requirements, and the software team, you know, reduced the, the load on the software team by, you know, a thousand percent. So what we would do then is we would sort of consolidate the learning from these iterative phases into the software team, and then we would create supported releases that we would then push out once a month. So that was really the crucial thing. That was really a turning point. So this is the architecture or diagram of the architecture. We've got the Lua behavior at the top. Um, we've got the MCM main files, which are, are like glue, basically. So this is the, uh, you know, sort of the C++, which is, you know, uh, has the main routine in um, and also does things like set up the logger. Then we've got a swig wrapper, um, which we will get to uh, shortly. Uh, that's got that's quite an interesting thing. We will, we will talk about that. Uh, and then underneath the Swig wrapper is the actions library. So like I said, these are C++ components that are designed to provide capabilities. So like timer, um, obviously gives you uh, blocking and non-blocking weights, and it's built on top of ASIO. Message allows uh, radios to talk to each other across TCP connections um, via an Ethernet network. Scan enables you to scan the, uh, the spectrum looking for PCPs. Um, connect, disconnect, pretty obvious. So you can see that these are sat on a set of third-party libraries. So we're using SpeedyLog, which is a great piece of, um, a, a great logging library. ASIO, which is obviously also excellent, which you probably, almost everybody has probably heard, you know, heard of, maybe, you know, probably used. Um, and something that Blue Wireless invented called the Connection Manager API, uh, which was really an interface between uh, user-level code and the uh, Linux driver. And then down below, obviously, we've got the map, the phi, and the radio. So, okay, that's the background. Like I said, I think it's useful to have in mind um, some context of why these ideas are useful and what it's really buying you. Uh, so, um, has anybody got any questions about that, or shall we uh, um, shall we just carry on? Just looking at the chat window, give you a chance to sort of uh, understand that. And actually, yeah, having looked at the chat window, there are some excellent comments. So James is saying flexible in, uh, means it's probably got lots of tests. I would completely agree with that. Uh, and Piotr says uh, easy to change without coding, which is absolutely spot on. Um, so, yeah, very good. Okay, so let's carry on. So this section, okay, let's delve into the details then. How do we actually do this for real? 
Okay, Lua. So uh, what is it? Well, it's a, a lightweight, embeddable scripting language. Um, now, the nice thing about Lua is that it's dynamically typed, runs by interpreting bytecode. It's very fast. Um, you know, there are uh, JIT engines out there for it. Uh, you know, it's really, it, you, you know, it's, it's blisteringly fast. Has a simple procedural syntax. And this is, this is a nice thing because Lua has what I would sort of term tool appeal. Um, and by that, I mean, there are certain tools uh, which just resonate you know, with with you. Um, so I don't know. Remember, you guys uh, ever saw the first time you saw C plus plus eleven, or the first time I saw C plus plus eleven or C plus plus OX as it was at the time? Uh, I immediately had a sort of a you know a sort of a, an emotional reaction, thinking, "Yep, this is the way forward. This is what we need. This is what I want to spend my life doing." Um, and there are other things like that, like the first time you saw Unix, maybe um, you know that kind of thing. So Lua has a, a really nice syntax, and as I say, what's what's good about that is it means that FAEs and you know people who are not necessarily sort of deeply into um, C++ code can uh, look at a piece of Lua and go, mm, I can change this, I can get this, uh, you know, uh, to um, uh, do what I want, and that's very cool. Um, the emphasis in Lua is on meta mechanisms, and this is what keeps it so nice and small. So, by meta mechanisms, what I'm talking about are things like um, tables. So, Lua only really has one, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, data structure, which is the table. So, like an associative array, a map, basically. Uh, and the premise is that you can build any uh, data abstraction you want on top of that. So, if you want a list, fine. You know, those are just uh, that's just uh, an associative array where the keys are um, 1 to n. If you want an array, same thing. Uh, if you want a tree, that's just a, a table of tables where um, you have you know, keys that are left and right. So you, you get the sort of the idea. Um, and uh, as I said, what, what this you know, amounts to is it, you, know, you have an instant appeal for sort of architects, FAEs, um, people like that. So I can imagine it working quite well for people like traders and quants and things like that as well. So. Okay, the Lua stack. All right, so Lua communicates with C++ through a virtual stack. Yes, absolutely. Um, but strict stack discipline is not enforced. So it's more like a sort of a Jenga tower, really. Um, so normally with a stack, obviously we interact through the top of the stack. So you know you put you push in the bottom. So positive indices are always indexed from the bottom of the stack. And by the way, um, one thing to sort of bear in mind with Lua is that indexing starts from one, not zero. Okay, so sometimes, you know, coming from a sort of C++ background, um, that, you know, that's a bit of a gotcha. Negative indices are relative to the top. So you can go, uh, you can count minus one is the top, minus two would be one down from the top and so forth. So there are, okay, so what you'll find as you get into Lua, there are some pseudo indices um, for the Lua registry and up values. Lua registry is basically a global table, uh, which is global to all C++ um, Code. So, uh, but you have to be a bit careful you don't uh, collide with names. Up values are like static values, uh, static variables in C. Um, and uh, it, you can use them to create uh, the lower Lua definition of a closure. Uh, oh, and this is handy as well. So, you can compile the interpreter with an API check to enable checking on the stack because it is quite easy to sort of get this, um, get this wrong. Uh, so, that's worth knowing as well. OK, let's see some examples. Let's see some code. So this is a first example. And what this example is going to show is how to call some Lua from C++ and have that Lua call back into C++. So as I say, it's the very first example. Um, now, by the way, all of this code uh, is complete. Um, so you can cut and paste this. If you cut and paste this off the slide uh, into files, I'll show you how to build it in a minute. Um, but you know, I believe in trying to sort of give people um, uh, solid examples that they can use and, and, and actually work with. So this is a, this is a complete example. Um, so you could take that and actually actually try it. So what we're doing here is two things. Uh, so we're creating global table T, and we're declaring a function f. And as it stands at the moment, uh, oh, and yes, as uh, as part of that function f, we are calling a C++ function, um, which we'll see on the next slide. But basically, as this piece of Lua stands, if you run it in an interpreter, it won't do anything. There's no stimulus. So we need some stimulus, and that's going to be in the form of the C++. So OK, let's have a look at this. All right. So um, the first thing to note is here's our CPP func. 
uh, here's the actual declaration. And this is the uh, uh, Lua state variable, which is like an execution state. So um, when dealing with the sort of the Lua C, C++ API, um, you'll find that Lua states are basically everywhere. So this is passed around everywhere. Then what this function is going to do, so is uh, print out a message, and then we are going to uh, proceed from the bottom of the stack, so positive index, to the top, and we're going to step through it like this and just basically convert whatever's on um, each stack entry into a string and print it out. Okay. Then let's have a look at the main function. All right, so this is how we do, so how we do initialization. So we create a new Lua state, Okay, and that's just allocating a piece of memory. Open some libraries. We're going to register our CPP func into the Lua space. And then we're going to load a file, uh, which we pass in on the command line. So if, as I say, if you cut and paste what's on the previous slide into a file, that's what you're going to load. Uh, and then we're going to call that file. So we're going to um, evaluate it, if you like. And as I say, all that's going to do at the moment is to just bring the, uh, the two declarations, T and F, uh, into visibility. So by the way, this pcall function, what it does, pcall stands for protected call. This is obviously the Lua state. Uh, this is the number of arguments we are passing to the thing we are calling. And this, this will all become clearer in a minute. Uh, this is the number of return values we're expecting, which is zero at the moment. And because it's protected, basically what you can do is you can place on the Lua stack a function. Um, so you can push a function. Uh, which will uh, be called in case of error. So if there's an error, then that function will be called. And the way that you actually pass that to pcore is you give the stack index to that function here. Okay, anyway. Okay, so let's... Okay, let's now actually call our function f. And we're going to do this with the arguments how, so just a string, t.x and the number 14. And I should point out that um, this sequence of calls I've borrowed from the, the Lua documentation. If you click the link here, and if you go here, um, then you can read the, read all of this in context. So, Okay, so what are we doing? Well, we need to set up the stack before we can call f. So we're going to get this global f, okay? And because we've done this pcore here on line 26, um, that is now in scope. Uh, so that goes onto the stack right at the bottom. Then we're going to push a string literal, how? And then we're going to get the global t. So now we've got the table on the stack. Okay. From that, we're going to get the field x and push its value onto the stack. But before we can pass this to the function, we need to remove table t from the stack. Okay. So we're going to do that by saying lua remove minus 2. So remember, top of the stack at the moment is the value of t.x. And then the one down, so at the minus 2 index, is the table t. So we get that, so that comes out to the side. Then we're going to push an integer, that's our third argument, and then we can actually call the function f. So we're going to pass three args and one result. And just for brevity, I haven't done anything with the return value here. Um, actually, the return value is actually the return value of CPP func up here. Um, but if you were to inspect what's on the stack at this point, you'd find the value zero. So this is how you build and run it. Um, on a Mac, you can uh, use brew, install, Lua. Should get you there. Um, on uh, Linux, uh, so Ubuntu or uh, Mint, uh, you can do sudo apt get minus y install Lua 5.3. Um, build with Clang, so I tested this on a Mac. So this is on Catalina. Um, and this is just a system compiler, so it's not a special version of Clang or anything like that. Uh, and then you run it like this. So you say, run my executable, pass my file of Lua, and you get the output that we were expecting. OK. Do a chat. All oh, right. OK. So hopefully, that's given you some idea of how the low-level Lua to C++ interactions work. And certainly, when you start looking at Swig wrappers and things get, get a lot more complex, um, an understanding of how the Lua stack operates is vital. So being able to sort of read that code, and particularly understanding the indices, um, you know, that's quite important. So. So let's step forward and let's look at some modern C++. So after all, I promised you a talk on modern C++. And so far, all we've done is we've just pushed strings and integers onto the stack and stuff. So um, uh, so what I've done uh, is to create a starter application called LuaChat. 
um, which you can clone from my GitHub and use as the basis for your own combined C++ and Lua projects. So Jason Turner, um, who was here last year, he published a really good thing uh, on his YouTube channel a while ago, a C++ starter project that was uh, really popular. So I thought what I'd do is to try and um, give you guys a, uh, a C++ stroke Lua um, starter project. And that's called Lua Chat. So what it is, is a Unix talk program. So written in C++ 17 and Lua 535. Um, and by talk program, I, I, I'm sort of assuming that everybody knows what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, and basically what a talk program allows you to do is if you're logged on to a Unix server and you can type talk and then somebody else's username and you get an interactive window pop up on both terminals and you can have a conversation in real time. So as I say, it's on GitHub, it's MIT licensed. I really don't mind um, you know, uh, what you do with it. Uh, if, if you find bugs or something, please do obviously feed that back to me. I'm very receptive to bug reports and pull requests. Um, so I'm very keen that you guys have as high a quality experience with this as possible. Okay, using ASIO for asynchronous TCP and timers. So I went for ASIO because um, it's basically got everything, uh, everything um, I could want in it. And um, obviously you guys are probably all fairly familiar with ASIO, uh, uh, or at least you, you, know, you have some, con some concept of it. But also LuaChat is quite a good example of how to use ASIO as well, because if you are for, you know, sort of, um, you, you know, lo always looking around for examples of how to do asynchronous TCP or timers or whatever, then hopefully Lua Chat will give you a nice, up-to-date, compact example of how to do that. So using SpeedyLog for logging, which is an excellent logger. If you've not come across it, I'd highly recommend it. It's header-only. They have just recently re uh, released 170. And basically what it allows you to do is to configure um, various syncs, so you can have logging going to files that are rotated automatically, syslog, um, stood air, and you can, uh, you know, have multiple levels of logging. So, you know, right away from sort of trace, debug, info, warn, um, error, critical. Uh, CXX, CXX ops for command line processing, also excellent, and CMake um, for the build chat. Okay, so just in case you don't know what a, uh, a Unix talk application looks like, here is um, Lua Chat running. Um, so you can see basically, uh, and th there are lots of examples of how to run it and get it going on my GitHub page. So if you go and look at the markdown on that, you can, you, you can get the full instructions. But basically, you can see I'm having a conversation with myself. Um, so I'm saying, hi there. And then it's coming out on the other, uh, the other window. Hi there. So I say, hello, hello. Um, are you enjoying C++ on C 2020? Yes, it's absolutely brilliant. Thanks. OK, so you, you guys get the idea. Uh, this is the architecture, so it looks a lot like the MCM architecture, um, but obviously it's uh, it's simplified. Um, so, like I said, the idea is to sort of give you guys a sort of a high quality example um, that's you know not so simplistic that you exhaust it in five minutes, but not so complex that you need to invest you know sort of significant time in in terms of understanding and learning it. Here are some build instructions. So uh, I've put them in the slides if you, um, because some people actually like to do this in real time. So um, if you, you you can just, if you sort of trust what's going on here, you can uh, cut and paste that into a terminal window and that should um, should get you 90%, well, it should get you there basically. But any problems with that, I've, I have tested it on, on various machines and got other people to test it and stuff. But if there are any issues, then please do let me know and I'll um, fix the slides. Okay, Swig, right. So I keep talking about Swig, um, or I've mentioned it a few times. And the stack operations that we saw in the first example, really, you know, these things are, to my mind, primitives. So like I said, it, we're, we're pushing integers and strings. So we haven't even, uh, and we, we, you know, I want to talk about modern C++ and how we interface that. So um, uh, we haven't got there yet. So how are we going to do it, basically? So those primitives are, as I say, primitives. And to my mind, you don't necessarily want to manipulate them directly. So what we need is an abstraction tool, and SWIG is, is great for that. So SWIG as an acronym stands for a Simplified Wrapper and Interface Generator. And what it does is it produces C++ bindings for many target languages. And it's a really good piece of code. Um, uh, you know, it's got a big community uh, uh, and actually a very friendly community. So if you ask questions, you'll get back, you know, sort of really friendly answers. 
So what we're going to use it for is to generate Lewis stack calls for standard C++ types. And the key benefit of using Swig is that actually things like std string, std vector, std map, this all just comes for free. Swig just gives you this for free. So that's good. That's a step forward. So at least now, uh, when I refer to a std string in my C++, then that will map to a Lewis string and vice versa. Okay, so that, that's a step forward. Um, C++ 20 types can be supported with type maps. So we can actually teach Swig about types uh, and how to interface them between languages through the use of type maps. And we're going to have a look at a couple of examples of that in a minute. Integrates really well with CMake. Um, if you'd like to see that for yourself, here you are. Um, so that's from Lua Chat. And uh, I mean, that's basically all there is to it. Um, uh, you have up here an input file. So Swig has its own input file syntax, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, and then you just specify the language that you want. In Lua, you know, so here I'm saying Lua. But the nice thing about Swig and this architecture is that if you wanted to, say, produce bindings in Lua and Python, for example, then you could just have another .i file um, and then just generate the Python bindings as well. And that's really useful because it means that you can use Lua for your deployment, but then, say, if you want to be able to drive your actions from a Python test bench in your CI or whatever, um, then you can just generate some bindings here, uh, and it all comes from the same source. So it's, it's really quite it's quite nice to do. Okay, so let's have a look at um, some Swig input files. Uh, now, at first glance, these these can be a little bit um, you, well, you know, they, they they have their own syntax. Uh, so there's a little bit of learning that needs to take place. But once you get into it, um, it becomes you know sort of very quick and very intuitive. So let's just just have a quick brief overview of this. So the first thing to notice is this is the uh, this is where you actually specify the name of your module. And the module is what you'll be using to interact with um, in your uh, target language. So like Lua, um, you'll see when we sort of get into the Lua a bit more, uh, you'll see a lot of reference to um, actions dot uh, and things like that. Then uh, you can include uh, all of these standard types, so like std string, there's a whole bunch of these um, for all the sort of the standard C++ types. So as I say, they sort of come for free. Um, and then there's this block here. And um, what this is doing is uh, basically this is injecting code directly into the Swig wrapper. Now, the thing to sort of understand is what, what's happening here is Swig is going to take your input file, it's going to read that, and then it's going to scan your source files. And from that, it's going to generate a wrapper in C++, which then gets compiled and turned into a library. And that becomes your actions library. Now, between this percent brace uh, percent brace notation, basically are any declarations, definitions, whatever um, that you need in order to make the Swig wrapper compile. So here I'm just including the header files of the actions. Then the next step is to actually include the files to be wrapped by Swig. Um, so here I'm including my logging support, and there's no you know there's no trickery here. I'm not having to compromise on the C++ code that I'm writing at all. Um, this is all completely invisible. I can, I can write exactly the code I want to write in C++, and I can, uh, I can have it scanned by Swig here. And then we've got this block of code at this point. What I'm doing is defining a macro. Um, and uh, in Lua chat, basically, the only place where exceptions are thrown is from the constructors um, for the actions. And everything is constructed at start of day. Um, so basically, these would, these would become startup errors. Then once we're into sort of steady state, then we use other mechanisms, so like flags and stuff. Um, but uh, but essentially, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to catch any exception that's thrown in a constructor, and I want to send it through the logging framework. So I don't I don't want it to just necessarily just go straight to the console. I want to see it. Um, I want to route it via speedy log, um, and then that comes out on um, syslog or std error or um, you know that's all up to you to define. And then finally, what we're doing here is we're going to actually include the actions and define the exception handlers. So this piece of code is basically saying, catch you know, exceptions related to the default constructor of the talk action and um, wrap them with this piece of code. Okay? And then I'm including the header file of the actual action. And as I say, there's no sort of there's no trickery here. There's no, you know, it's not like I, I can only write my code in a subset of C++ or anything like that. No, there's none of that. I can write the code I want in C++. I can write the code that I want in Lua, and Swig is is uh, gluing them together. Type maps. Okay, so 
what do these do? Well, these map C++ types onto types in the target language. So um, and those types include uh, things in C++20 um, or, or whatever you want, or your user-defined types, whatever. So through this mechanism, we can add support for modern C++ abstractions. And one of the, one of the examples uh, that I'm going to go through now is callbacks. So one of the sort of things that people will, you know, uh, ask immediately when they see this sort of model is, how do I map a Lua function to a std function? Because in my C++, I, I just want to you know, operate in terms of std functions. I don't want to have any concept of uh, you know, complex Lua functions. That, that should be transparent to me. And similarly in Lua, as well, you know, I want to be able to just pass the name of a function into a C++ um, uh, method uh, and have that just map across immediately. I, I shouldn't have to do any sort of conversions or, or stack manipulations or anything like that. So we're going to look at callbacks. I just point out as well that um, my buddy Petar actually, he originated the following um, code, the original version, and then I hacked it. Uh, and then, in fact, he fixed the, uh, the bug that I introduced. So um, uh, thank you, Petar. Okay, so okay, uh, so this is a swig type map for a Lua callback, and there's a, a fair amount of complexity on this slide, so I'm very conscious of that. If you go to this link here, you will be taken to a gist on my GitHub um, where there, this example is is complete, along with C++ code that you can again uh, build and run and try for yourself. Um, so this is just a snippet. Um, that's why it looks a bit incomplete. But if you go to the gist at this link up here, um, then you can find uh, the whole the whole example and including some build instructions as well. So let's step through it. All right. So type checks. What are these for? Okay. What this is saying is uh, in the next rule, when I see an example colon colon callback type being referred to, so a reference to that, and I want you to imagine for the purposes of this slide. That example colon colon callback uh, is a type defined in an example class called callback, uh, and it's an alias to std function void void. Okay, so std function that takes um, uh, functions or callables um, that do not return anything and do not take any arguments. Okay. So every time we refer to that in the following code, um, we can check that what's actually been offered to us as a candidate for type conversion is in fact a function. And the code to do that is here. So we're going to say Lua is function uh, L, that's our Lua state in the swig wrapper for Lua, that's global, um, dollar input. OK, so dollar input is the candidate, the thing that we are passing from Lua um, to C++. And dollar one is the result. OK, so that gives us a Boolean result. If that goes wrong, we get a nice error message, um, which is great because uh, otherwise, we would have very subtle bugs. Um, and then we can proceed to the next part of the type map. So, OK, line five. This is a type map going into C++. So that's what this in is. Um, that means we are going from Lua into C++. So you can have type maps that go the other way, obviously, out of C++. And you can have in-out type maps as well. And what we're saying here is, OK, when the thing we are referencing in C++ is an example, colon, colon, callback, ref, um, then this type map will apply. Now, this thing in parens here, in parentheses, looks a bit like a sort of function declaration, makes this whole thing look a bit like a function declaration um, of sort, uh, but it's not. What this is saying is, in the body of the, the type map, give me an instance of example, colon, colon, callback, called temp. All right? Then the piece of code we're actually going to execute when we want to do this is as follows. So uh, Swig has this concept of, uh, well, Swig, and we'll call it FN. Then we're going to set it up uh, with the input, so the thing that we are being called with. Remember, we've already type checked this. We know that what we're being passed here is a function, so it's probably safe to just do that. Then temp, so this is our, um, this is our temporary instance. We're going to set to this lambda. So we're going to capture FN. And uh, when the function's called, we're going to execute this lambda. So we're going to say swig lua ref get, so, and then uh, get the reference. Lua p call, uh, fn.l, we get the lua state in the, in the, uh, in the reference. Um, and we know it's a void void function. So we know that there are no arguments, no return values, and we're not worried about checking the errors per se at the moment. Okay? And then finally, down here, we're going to set this to the 
result, we're going to set it to the um, address of temp. And the reason for that is because one is a pointer type. So um, it makes sense rather than do it directly. Uh, it make, It's a bit nicer syntactically to um, have a Lambda like this and um, just take the address of it. So a key thing to point out is that include the source files after the type map declarations. Because as sort of C++ programmers, we're all um, uh, very programmed to putting hash includes at the start of a file, uh, things like that. Uh, if you do that, uh, Swig will scan your file um, and it will apply all of the standard types. Uh, that's absolutely fine. But it won't know about your type maps uh, until after it's scanned your source files. So um, just watch out for that. That's uh, a bit of a gotcha. Um, uh, I've certainly fallen foul of that. I know lots of people do. OK. Right. So are there any questions at this point? So we're going to talk about the actions now. So this is um, the C++ parts. Um, any questions? Uh, OK. So oh, I need to uh, oh, and go to the Q&A section. Sorry. Ah, um, so somebody, oh, Timo has asked, uh, uh, did we consider using SALT2 instead of SWIG? Actually, um, I'd not heard of it, um, but I will now go and uh, look it up. That sounds very interesting. Um, uh, so perhaps, Timo, after this uh, uh, presentation, we could have a chat about that. Because, um, uh, yeah, that does sound uh, quite appealing. So, um, so uh, the simple, simple answer is I didn't know about it. Um, if I had, I would have certainly evaluated it. Um, so. Uh, yes. Oh, thank you very much for that. I shall uh, go and have a look. Okay, so no more questions at the moment. All right, so let's proceed with the actions then. So lure chat actions. So what have we got? Well, we've actually got three. If you sort of uh, cast your mind back to the lure chat architecture diagram, we've got a talk action, uh, which is based on ASIO, and that sends messages to a remote lure chat. But it also has to act as a server because we don't. What we don't want really is is a sort of send receive. You know, we don't necessarily need two actions to do the send and receive. We can do. We can just have a, a talk action that does both send and receive, if you like. Going to use TCP for fault tolerant in order delivery. Um, obviously, we want uh, messages to be retransmitted if they're lost on the wire. Um, and also, obviously, they, you know, the ordering semantics are quite nice. So we're getting that for free. So why not? Um, and what we're going to do with this, or the code I'm going to show you, is basically one asynchronous TCP connection per message. So you might think, OK, well, perhaps what we should do is just at the start of the session opening, we could just create a TCP connection and um, just use that for the whole uh, for the whole session. It's actually, uh, yes, you can do that. It makes the example code quite simplistic, um, which is why I didn't do that. So I went for one asynchronous TCP connection per message because it's just that little bit more interesting. It's just that, you know, it's just a step forward on from the kind of, um, you know, the sort of the obvious first implementation. We've got a timer. Uh, we need that to implement blocking and non-blocking weights. So we'll go through that uh, in a minute. Again, that comes from ASIO, great piece of code. Um, and that's required for the Lura coroutine dispatcher, so the scheduler, um, which we'll go into in a sec. So the log, and what that's doing is that's wrapping the speedy log primitives, um, so that's making them available to us in the Lua space. So like I said, so everything is really going through the logger, which is what we want. We don't really want sort of messages popping out through different routes and stuff. We want it all to be handled by the logger, uh, and that works really well. All right, TCP connections. So um, how do we do asynchronous one TCP connection per uh, message. Okay, so um, this is sort of heavily based on the, the boost uh, documentation. Again, if you go here, you, it will take you to um, the relevant section of Boost ASIO. Um, but basically, you know, what we're going to do, we can we can go through this now. So, uh, so we've got a TCP class, a TCP connection class, um, and we're going to manage them with shared pointers, shared putters. Um, so we declare this type, and also we've got this sort of factory star creation function here, um, which is just going to new up my TCP connections. IO contexts in, in ASIO parlance are basically executors. All right, so if you don't have an IO context, then you know nothing happens. Um, but, uh, um, but think of it basically as an executor. Uh, then just to sort of reinforce the, the message, we've got this uh, private constructor down here. So all that's doing is initializing the socket um, you know, and it's uh, in effect turning off the other constructors. We've got some getters, so I can just get up the socket 
Um, I'm returning mutable references. Uh, and the same with the, uh, what I've chosen to do is to bundle the data, um, so a st just a plain stud string, uh, in the TCP connection as well. And this is going to store data both for the outgoing messages, so when we're transmitting messages, and for messages when we've received them as well. Okay. Right, connection handling. So let's start looking at the actual talk action itself. So um, first thing to look at is in the constructor. So obviously we have this constructor, which we give a port number to, and that initializes an acceptor. So this is in effect our server, if you like, uh, and it's going to um, serve connections on a port that we pass in from the Lua. Um, then we call start accept, uh, which is a function which we'll go through in a moment. Basically, um, that's going to asynchronously call accept. So it's going to wait for a connection, in fact. Then this is, uh, this. is there's a thread here um, which we're initializing uh, with the uh, IO context run. So if you don't do that, then obviously ASIO doesn't do anything. Um, so you need to actually run the IO context. So we'll spawn a thread to do that. Then down in the start accept function, okay, we've got a, a TCP connection um, which we create. Uh, we're going to pass it our IO context, which is um, come via this route, so m acceptor get executor context, uh, and then we're going to call async accept, and we're going to do that for uh, the socket that comes out of the connection, and we're going to pass it this lambda, okay? And the reason for using a lambda here is because it means that we can refer to connection. Um, all the way down the chain in the handlers. Uh, so um, what that does is that maintains the lifetime of connection to the point where we want it to disappear. So when the last handler has finished, then obviously the handlers all uh, uh, bubble back up. Um, the shared putter uh, uh, gets um, destructed and the socket gets closed. So let's see what's next. Handle accept. Okay, so what are we doing here? So basically, what it all boils down to is this piece of code in the middle, so lines 6 to 15. Um, so we're accepting a connection, obviously providing there's no error. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to schedule an asynchronous read. So we pass it our socket, and we also pass uh, a dynamic buffer. So in this case, a stood string. And we're saying it's dynamic buffer, so uh, it means that the buffer can just resize um, accordingly. So uh, And then the thing we're going to give it is our stood string. So again, this is a mutable reference to stud string. And we're going to pass it a lambda for the handler as well. So we're going to do the same trick again. So we're passing in the connection. Um, and obviously, we've got our error code and bytes transferred, which, by the way, that's the prototype uh, that async read is expecting, is the error code and the bytes transferred. But then what this allows us to do is in the read handler, we can add our connection here. So we can keep it alive uh, as long as we need to. Then before we leave the function, we call start accept again. So we uh, uh, create another asynchronous accept for the next connection. All right, so we've scheduled a read. So at some point, the executor um, gets around to actually uh, reading some data. Um, what we're going to do first is check error. So if we've got no errors, or if we're seeing EOF, basically what that means is that the remote connection is closed. That's fine. That's OK. Um, then we're going to impose a, an arbitrary limit on the message array. Um, you don't have to do this, obviously. Um, but in an embedded context, uh, I, I tend to personally try and keep things sort of fairly bounded where possible. Um, but you know, entirely up to you. So if we if the message array, and by the way, this is just a std vector of std string, uh, is getting bigger than some constant that we define, uh, then we're going to just take the first one and just erase it. So we're going to erase the first um, message. Uh, that is the oldest message. So we'll just throw that away. Um, then what we're doing is we're going to store a message for Lua retrieval. So we're emplacing our connection data into the back of the M messages array. And at that point, um, we're OK. We can release the connection at this point. It's, it's done with. Um, so there's no more references to connection. And when the, the read handler returns, then um, connection will be destructed uh, and um, the socket will be closed. And the memory is freed, obviously. OK, then this fu last function, this is a getter. So we'll see this in a minute uh, in the context of the Lua. So um, all we're doing here is we're just returning a message. So if nothing's available, return an empty string. Otherwise, just take the first one, remove it from the end messages array, and just return it. 
All right, so on to the sort of the Lua behavior then for Lua chat. Does anybody want to ask anything at this point? Let's have a few seconds. No. Okay. All right. I think we'll just, I think we'll proceed. All right. Coroutines. Um, I love coroutines. Um, uh, I'm not sure I should admit that as such, but uh, no, I really do. Um, for me, they're most useful when you're trying to make use of latency in a thread. So if you're looking at a thread body with some blocking operation and you're thinking, hmm, um, there's another part of this thread which could really do some useful work at this point, uh, then coroutines are great. Um, and I find them very useful. Uh, Lua coroutines are stackful, uh, meaning that each coroutine is allocated a full execution stack. And in the sort of context of Lua, that probably makes sense because um, Lua is uh, using coroutines as, in effect, a sort of uh, kind of like, I think, well, I think most people use Lua coroutines as sort of fibers. Um, so you want to have that flexibility of being able to uh, suspend and resume um, anywhere. Um, the, the, the sort of the drawback with stackful coroutines is that they have quite high memory requirements. So um, they're not particularly scalable, which is why basically the world is sort of moving towards, uh, or, or rather other, other software is moving towards stackless coroutines. Uh, and that includes C++20, which is great, because C++20 coroutines are stackless. Um, uh, and that's fantastic, because from my perspective, that uh, complements really well, because uh, you can have the uh, Lua coroutines, which, as I say, you, in, in my case, you want to treat as fibers, in effect. Um, but then the heavy lifting can be done by the C++20 coroutines, which are stackless. And um, you can have you know, millions or billions of them, which in kind of networking applications is quite useful, because um, you know, sometimes you're talking about packets or connections or whatever. So um, the other key benefit of stackless coroutines is that context switching is much faster. Um, and uh, Gore Nishinov um, has written a whole bunch of excellent um, WG21 papers on this. Um, in fact, actually, I mean, Gore, for those of you who don't know, um, Gore Nishinov really uh, and his team at Microsoft are really, you know, sort of drove the whole uh, C++ coroutine um, effort, basically. And um, if you want to really understand C++ 20 coroutines, I'd highly recommend reading through some of Gore's WG21 papers, particularly uh, N3985 and N4402. Um, so I'll, I'll add a link. When, when this comes out on YouTube at some point, I'll add some links to that. Um, uh, I would start around, you know, start around 2014, work forward. If you're in the position where you're sort of thinking, well, I'm, I'm not completely sure what stackful coroutines, what stackless coroutines. I've heard people talk about asymmetric, symmetric coroutines. Um, if you're trying to sort of really understand and uh, grok those pieces of terminology, then have a look at some of Gore's uh, earlier papers. And there's also some incredible talks on, um, C uh, well, that were at CPPCon. So there was one really good one in 2016 by James McNellis, um, who talked about coroutines as well. So, so hopefully that gives you some good pointers. Um, so in, in the Lua context, uh, the, the nice thing is, is that you can have clusters of coroutines, but they're, they're running inside the same thread, okay? So the fact that it's single-threaded, it's really good because it means it's lock-free. There are no races. Um, you don't have to have synchronization. Um, so all of that complexity and all that trickiness just disappears, basically. The other good thing as well in Lua, which is quite useful in an embedded context, is you get to implement your own dispatcher. Um, and this is quite useful because it gives you knobs you can twiddle um, to, you know, in effect, adjust the granularity of your, your Lua code and um, the sensitivity or the, or the responsivity of it, in fact. So let's have a look at um, the actual behavior. So we've got sender coroutine. This is going to send input to the peer. Uh, we've got a receiver coroutine prints received messages from the peer, uh, a dispatcher coroutine, which schedules the sender and the receiver, and main, the main code, which processes the arguments and creates coroutines. Okay. So here's the sender coroutine. Now, um, this, by the way, is like the whole thing. Um, so uh, I've not, you know, you know, sort of like truncated this or anything. This is actually the code. So um, what we're doing is we've got a while true loop, and um, what I'm doing here is I'm polling stood in the stood in file descriptor, which is obviously um, FD0, uh, with a timeout, a timeout of one second, right? And the reason for that is because if we just use poll here, 
uh, that's a blocking operation and the whole thing would block until the user had entered something and then pressed enter. So you don't want that because you want uh, messages to be received from your peer asynchronously and appear on your console asynchronously. Okay, so if ret equals one, this means we've got something uh, actually has arrived on stood in, so the user has typed a message. Um, we call IO read to read it into a buffer. If that's just the empty string, sorry, if that's not equal to the empty string, um, then we actually we can actually send it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to call our C++ action, so send, um, uh, which is part of the talk action. And this is how you actually call a C++ method. Um, it's this colon notation. And we're going to pass um, our host name, our port, and the actual message to send. Oh, sorry, the destination host name, the destination port, and the message to send. If all goes well, we're going to log that. Uh, we're going to send ourselves a log message. And looking at this, I'm thinking I, I probably should do something if it doesn't all go well. Um, so again, you know, if error type uh, underscore success is, is not equal to ret, um, then you could obviously log an error message. Uh, and then right at the bottom, we've got our coroutine yield. So if we're just spinning here, if we're just constantly polling um, stood in and not seeing anything, then um, each, each time we do that, we, we're yielding. So here's the receiver, even simpler. Um, so again, uh, we're in this while true loop, um, and we're just going to spin in this uh, repeat until loop until a message is available. And again, you know, this is calling into C++ at this point. So this is our talk action um, calling is message available, which is returning a Boolean. If it is, we're going to receive it uh, from C++. Um, again, this is uh, just a Lua string, well, just a Lua variable that we're going to use as a string. Uh, we print it, and then we print it actually on the console, um, and that's it. Then this is the dispatcher. So this is slightly more complex, um, but actually when you see it, you get this sort of nice kind of uh, pseudo multi-threading effect, um, and it seems quite quite obvious uh, once you sort of um, had a look at it. And again, if you go here, this will take you to the official Lua docs for dispatchers, but, um, but we can go through it. Uh, so we create a timer. So again, this is one of our uh, actions, um, and that sits in this timer variable. Then we're going to go into this while true loop. If, and we have a table of coroutines here, if that is empty, right, then no more coroutines to run. So we're going to break out of this while loop um, and call it, uh, and that's it. We have a graceful exit from the system. Um, otherwise, if we do have coroutines to run, we're going to take the next one and we're going to resume. So we're going to resume, which is going to jump back either into the sender or the receiver, um, depending on which one's uh, turn it is next. If we get a result from a coroutine, right, then that in this setup means that the coroutine is exited. And if that result is a string, uh, if that result is a string, then we've hit a runtime error. So uh, we log it as a critical and we print it. Otherwise, we might just print a warning just saying coroutine X is exited. That might be what you want. That's you know that might not be necessarily erroneous behavior. And then down here, what we're saying is um, coroutine's name. Because the coroutine's exited, we're going to remove it from uh, the coroutine's table. So that's how you do that in Lua. You would just say um, uh, coroutine's uh, and then the key, and you set it to nil. Then this line here looks a bit bit more interesting. So we need a blocking weight here because. If you don't have a blocking weight at all in the system, then what you're going to end up with is a busy weight. Um, your CPU utilization goes to 100%, and uh, you know people come in and ask you questions. Um, so I've interjected a one millisecond weight here, uh, which is again, you know, this is based on ASIO, so it's calling back into C++. Um, and I'm just saying wait on a blocking weight for one millisecond, and that reduces my CPU load down to about you know. 5% of one core. Um, now, this gives you a very nice sort of knob to twiddle because you can adjust the sensitivity of your system. So if you find you're missing events, you can just simply um, make this uh, um, time smaller. Um, if you find that actually you're receiving all of your events, but your CPU load's a bit high, you can make this delay a bit bigger. Uh, and the reason that this is all Fs is because this is the ID of the timer. So I want to allow user timers to basically indexed from zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. So I've put my uh, dispatcher timer right at the highest possible value. So it's nice and out of the way. Okay. 
Right. So uh, I'm conscious that I'm reaching the end of my slot. So conclusions. Uh, so if there are any questions, please do um, post them now. Uh, so I'm looking at the Q&A window. Uh, yeah, great. All right. That'd be excellent, Tima. Um, okay, conclusions. So performance. So I just wanted to touch on performance very briefly. So given these MPUs are like desktop machines, right? then one of the nice things you can do is you can run perf on them. So for the MCM, uh, obviously, you know, and this architecture is not really compute or I/O bound. Um, we're certainly not trying to do anything to the networking traffic or the, you know, anything per packet or uh, crazy like that. But the thing we are interested in profiling is the responsivity of the software to events. So things like handover time and you know, trying to work out what's the disruption to the user's traffic when we make a decision to switch radios, and that really has a very strong commercial dimension because the first question from a customer is always you know, what bandwidth do you support and what range? And then the second question is, what's the handover time and what's the penalty of doing that? So we did a, a perf analysis, uh, and it's very interesting. And there are some general nuggets that I want to, you know, sort of take from that and share with you guys here. So the first thing is that actually, uh, or the first sort of aha moment was that we noticed that the MCM was spending quite a lot of time in the swig wrapper, um, which when you think about it is, is probably reasonable because it's bouncing backwards and forwards between C++ and Lua quite a lot. Um, so what I'm saying is uh, just be, be wary of that, be conscious of that. And if you can, sort of prefer lightweight type maps. So don't do any sort of heavy mem copies or anything like that in those um, wrappers. Um, the, the, the thing with the wrappers is that, you know, there tends to be sort of a, an initial push to kind of get things working uh, and then they get forgotten about. People tend to focus on the Lua and the C++ a lot more um, than the type map in between. So actually, as far as performance goes, that's quite a, a significant part of the system. The other thing to do is to sort of uh, think very seriously about how you partition C++, you know, the way you draw that line between what you implement in C++ and what you implement in Lua. Um, and it's not a, a fixed line by any stretch. I mean, you can, we certainly have done, is move things that were in Lua into C++ and vice versa um, because it's more convenient or more, you know, you, there are performance benefits. But think about that upfront before you do anything. And in particular, think, think about the concurrency design. Um, so uh, with this, I tend to try and keep things um, sort of as simple as possible. Um, but you know, you know, clusters of coroutines uh, that operate in threads uh, are probably perfectly reasonable. Um, if you need to have proper OS threading in Lua, have a look at Lua Lanes, um, which is very good for that. And also it has a, um, a communication mechanism that will allow you to communicate between OS threads without incurring uh, any costs, certainly not at the user level, so there's no user level locking. Um, and that's certainly uh, you know, very well supported and people are, are very keen on that. If you want to be able to communicate between OS threads in C++ and OS threads in Lua, um, and this is getting more complex, have a look at 0MQ. If you've not um, seen that before, that's also uh, um, very good uh, library, very interesting uh, piece of code. Okay, so how the code interacts with Lua is significant as well. So what I tend to do is to prefer sort of pre-compiled, long-lived behaviors. And what I mean by that is, um, in effect, you know, the system starts up and then it goes into the Lua behavior. And then apart from obviously what we're pulling from the um, uh, the C++, um, uh, it stays in the Lua behavior. So uh, and and you can you can pre-compile those um, to uh, obviously remove that from runtime. Runtime cost, and if you need even more speed, you can uh, use Lua JIT, um, which is you know fantastic piece of code um, written by a chap called Mike Paul. Um, people seem to think that uh, Lua JIT has like finished, um, you know, finished its development or whatever, because I think the last uh, date referenced on the web page is is 2017, or the last major release was 2017. But if you go and actually look at the Lua JIT repo, the Git repo, you'll find that there's a stream of commits. I think the most recent one was like a few days ago or something like that. So it's you know really good, really interesting piece of code, well worth a look. Okay, conclusion. So the combination of C++ and Lua is powerful. Um, and it's very good. There are a number of benefits. As I say, the key ones for us was being able to change things in the field without a compilation environment and empowering others to do the same so that they could answer their own questions. And if you find yourself very much you know, uh, with a system where compilation is a, a, a big cost, so if it takes you, you know, sort of hours to compile code, or um, you're in a very intense real-time environment, so like a you know 
uh, trading desk or something like that, then actually being able to you make rapid changes to the lure um, is actually really useful. And as I say, you know, uh, customers seem to be a lot more comfortable with making a change to a piece of lure than they are with me making a change to a, a binary, um, especially when I'm going to push it out onto uh, a rail network or something like that. So um, very worth bearing in mind. So we've got this, this fundamental abstractions, uh, actions, which are C++ capabilities, primitives, and behaviors, um, which are written in Lua. SWIG allows us to map C++ 20 types to and from Lua. Um, so right after this uh, um, uh, talk, I'm going to go and have a look at SOL2. Um, uh, so thank you, Timo. I will check that out. Uh, but uh, have a look at SWIG. It's very good for a great piece of code. Um, uh, I would, uh, well, I mean, we're using it in very much in a production environment. As I say, it's very mission critical for us. So uh, you can do, you can map any types, obviously. So other candidates um, that I was going to think about including in the talk, like stood any, stood optional, stood variant, um, you know, but just be mindful of performance. So just be careful. Like I said, about big copies or anything like that, you want to try and, um, you know, sort of minimize that kind of thing. And the other key thing is Lua 5.4.0 is now available. Um, so this is the first release where the uh, middle digit uh, has changed in five years. Uh, and literally this came out, I think it was on the 20th of June. So as I was writing the slides. Um, so now is actually a really good time. If you've if you're either got, you know, sort of Lua knowledge um, that's uh, not up to date or whatever, um, then it's worth investing some time because... Uh, it's really quite a useful thing to have in your toolbox. And certainly if you get into Lua now, uh, and in particular with its combination with C++, then um, the likelihood of uh, Lua changing dramatically is in the short term is very slight. So it means that the lifetime of that knowledge, if you like, um, you know, that knowledge is going to stay fresh for um, quite a while. So one thing that uh, doesn't get um, a lot of coverage is I find very useful the Lua Quick Reference. Um, that has been updated for Lua 540. Um, uh, so certainly there's obviously all the, the really good, there's programming in Lua uh, on the, the Lua website, which is an excellent book. I uh, highly recommend that. But as I understand it, this is the only text currently, and I might be wrong, um, that's been updated for Lua 540. So um, for you guys who are all, you know, sort of obviously expert experienced, programmers, um, then the quick reference, you know, might might be a sort of a good place to start and um, a useful thing to, to look at. So, okay, that's the end of my talk. So again, this is my URL. So this is my uh, website, if you like. Uh, you can reach me here, this email address. Um, this is the uh, URL for the slides. They're all online. Um, you can obviously, you know, sort of click around and try the examples. There's the, a, a gist on there as well, as I mentioned. Um, and this is the GitHub for Lua Chat. So if you, you can claim this and um, it's CMake. So in fact, actually, if I go here, um, it's, uh, you know, you've got sort of good level of documentation and stuff. So, but if you do find any problems, um, please do uh, um, uh, contact me. Uh, I'm very receptive to bug reports and to um, comments, suggestions, or whatever you think. But. Okay, so that's the end. Are there any more questions at this point, or um, what does what does everybody think? Okay, uh, I don't think there are any more questions as such. Um, and uh, oh, thank you, Anand. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, the kind words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe. Um.